So overall, six of the seven defendants found guilty of conspiring to cause an explosion, a deadly plot which the prosecution lawyers in this case said they planned to carry out on the UK. Two of the men found not guilty. Yes, Rachel, just remind us then of what these uh, five men, let me just run through them. Omar Khayyam, Wahid Mahmoud, Jawad Akbar, Anthony Garcia and Salhuddin Amin have been found in guilty of. The ch charge, the formal charge was conspiracy to cause explosions. But tell us from what you know of the case, what they have been found guilty of. What was the plot? That's right. The plot, according to the prosecution, was to carry out an attack on the UK, a deadly bomb attack. And although they had not finalised what that target would be, the court heard that they discussed targeting the Ministry of Sound nightclub here in central London. Surveillance uh, tapes of the defendants heard two of them talking about bombing those slags dancing around. They also discussed bombing Blue Water shopping centre in close to the M25, and after 234 hours of deliberations, the jury of five women and seven men in this case decided that they agreed with the prosecution case for five of these seven men and that they had been conspiring to do exactly that, to carry out a deadly bomb attack on the UK. And I think we can now reveal to you a little bit more about this case, something the jury were not told and something that I think will be found quite disturbing by members of the public. And that is the fact that these defendants, seven of them, whilst they were under surveillance for a six-week period between January and March 2004. During that time, some of the defendants in this case met with two of the people who carried out the 7-7 bombings. Now, the judge, Sir Michael Astor QC, ruled that the jury in this case should not be told of that connection. He said it would be too prejudicial to do so. And so the jury never learnt of it. But we can now tell you that during that period of surveillance, there were, during that six-week period, four meetings between Mohammed Sadiq Khan, who was the 7-7 ringleader, the man who bombed Edgware Road, and Shezad Tamwir, the Aldgate Road bomber. And they met two of these defendants on a number of occasions. Um, Rachel, then, so the connection um, established, but you say it's worth reiterating, isn't it? This was not part of this case. Uh, this was uh, evidence that was ruled inadmissible in this particular case. So the jury have taken their time to reach the decisions they've reached today, but unaware of that particular fact. That's right. So Michael Astor QC, the judge in this case, said that that was not for this jury to know that it would be prejudicial, and that's why they were not told about it. But let me tell you a little bit more about that surveillance operation, because it was the biggest one of its kind. 33,800 hours of watching, bugging movements that took place in the defendants' homes, in their cars, in internet cafes that they frequented. That operation carried out by MI5 agents and British anti-terror police. They continued that operation for six weeks until they felt that the plot was getting too close to fruition. And at that point, the men in this case were charged. And we're awaiting to hear at the moment the reaction from the courtroom and what Sir Michael Astor QC has to say to these men, five of them in total, who have been found guilty of conspiring to cause an explosion here in the UK, a case that's lasted a total of 13 months, a case that's estimated in some quarters to cost the taxpayer £50 million. Pounds. And it's already been announced there will be an inquiry into quite why it took as long as it did, although there were plenty of counts, 12 of them to be gone through in total, 101 witnesses called over the past year, many of them coming from Pakistan. There were visa delays and difficulties. That meant the trial lasted longer than it should have. It obviously went on over the period of Ramadan. And because of the defendant's faith and the fact that they were fasting, the court could only sit for three and a half hours over that time. The jurors' hearing aid broke down. It was plagued with difficulties. There will be great relief, I think, in legal circles that there has now been a verdict after so long in courtroom number eight here at the Old Bailey. Rachel, thank you very much indeed for bringing us those verdicts from the court. Let's hear more now about the background of this case.
This is Omar Khayyam at a storage unit in West London. He thinks he's safely out of sight, inspecting a half ton of fertilizer, which he plans to turn into a bomb. But the bag no longer contains explosives because the police have caught up with Khayyam and his fellow terrorists. Round the clock surveillance revealing plans to target London's Ministry of Sound nightclub and one of Britain's largest shopping centres. A little explosion at Blue Water tomorrow, if you want. What about, for example, the biggest nightclub in central London, where no one can even turn around and say, oh, they're innocent, those slags that are dancing around. <laughs> the police charged seven men, Omar Khayyam, Jawad Akbar, Wahid Mahmood, Nabil Hussain, Anthony Garcia, Salahuddin Amin and Shuja Mahmood, all of them British. Men claim to be just days away from a deadly attack on the country they grew up in. They spent unremarkable childhoods in the leafy streets of Ilford, Crawley and Slough, and nothing here suggested what they would become. As they grew older, the group preferred the latest trainers to traditional Islamic dress, Omar Khayyam in particular becoming a talented sportsman. At the home he grew up in with brother Shuja Mahmood, the family Koran grew dusty through lack of use. Yet police would later find a hit list of synagogues here and bags of aluminium powder hidden behind the garden shed. For Kayam, things began to change in his late teens. He started attending the mosque and joined the now banned Islamic group Al Mahajarun. He also met Wahid Mahmood, who the prosecution claim already had Al Qaeda connections. But Mahmoud's college tutor saw no sign of extremism. He was quite relaxed and friendly and, and quite open. Um, when we interview people, we look for the ability to work collaboratively with others because you have to do that on this course. And he demonstrated that quality, both at interview and on the course. But those collaborative skills had already been put to good use outside the course. The terror cell all but formed. In the summer of 2003, four of the group travelled to a training camp in Pakistan where they learnt how to handle guns and make a bomb. Here they began to pick up the bomb's components, purchasing aluminium powder from a paint store. By November they'd returned home and picked up a vast sack of fertiliser from this agricultural merchants in Sussex. They hid it at access storage in West London, but staff became suspicious and the net began to close. Wahid Mahmood was recorded talking about targeting Blue Water Shopping Centre. It emerged he'd also stolen plans from his employer, detailing a grid of high-pressure gas lines running across southeast England. And the evidence of this man proved conclusive. Mohammed Jinaid Barber becoming the first Al-Qaeda supergrass to appear in a British court, giving a chilling insight into the defendant's plans to carry out a number of bombings simultaneously. The group arrest claimed the prosecution, in the end coming in the nick of time. Only now will the jury be told how close some of these defendants were to some of the 7-7 bombers. They, of course, did not get caught. The death and destruction they caused, the ultimate aim of the men brought to justice today.